enjoy a seat at the table and good company, where great conversations and meaningful discussions happen. Welcome to And Good Company. I'm Sarah Beetleholtz. We all know a great dinner party isn't really about the food. It's about the people seated around the table engaging in lively discussions. And Good Company gives you a seat at the table to enjoy smart and interesting conversations as they happen. I am pleased to be in the company of Senior Pastor of Trinity English Lutheran Church, Gary Erdos. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Sarah. Great. Thanks. So, um, first of all, um, you are the fifth pastor in the church's history. Uh, or at least the, the fifth pastor who... Senior pastor. Uh, senior pastor, yes, that is correct, yeah. And so that's, um, that gives it a good sort of consistency and longevity. And, um, but I want to start this conversation in looking at Fort Wayne is thought of as the city of churches. So There are a lot of them. Right. Supposedly, there's over 300, but, um, but we can get into that later. But what I wanted to find out is where does Trinity English Lutheran sort of stand or position itself? within this vast community of churches? Well, uh, we're part of the Lutheran community, and anybody who's part of the Lutheran community in Fort Wayne uh, knows that there are two branches of the Lutheran family, uh, what we call the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which actually has a seminary for training pastors here in Fort Wayne. And, and that part of the Lutheran family is probably the largest. Uh, Trinity is part of what is known as the ELCA, or Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And that has a perhaps a smaller representation in, in Fort Wayne, but yet part of that Lutheran community. So, you know, and, and with some of the German immigration that happened in Fort Wayne and, and Lutheranism being part of that tradition for at least some of those immigrants, it seems like it it occupies a spot, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the conversation. And is it, um, you know, you hear about those mega churches, those mm -hmm. very big, like those evangelical churches. Is Trinity part of that kind of evangelical, or is it a different? It's a different. I, I mean, that that word. Uh, our our part of Lutheranism was formed by a series of mergers over a long, over a long period of time, and back in nineteen. 85, 86, 87, 88, as they, as they were working towards this merger, the decision was made to use that word evangelical. Um, and a lot of people had debated its usefulness because in the American context, that word means something dramatically different than say in Germany, where the evangelical church is the Protestant church in Germany, that word has a different meaning in context than it does in the United States. So it does cause that kind of Evangelical, does that mean mm -hmm. like the people I see on TV? Right. Uh, you know, right. yeah. So that's not quite the way okay. we use the word. Uh, in, its, in its true linguistic sense, evangelical means gospel, you know, so okay. it's speaking of the story the of Jesus. Okay. Gospel. Speaking okay. Of the story of Jesus. And so, how, I mean, as a sect of Christianity, um, how is um, Lutheranism, I guess, or be, is different? I mean, what is it that's the, the teaching or the principle that caused you to break off or the or approach you take? Well, historically, you know, uh, Lutheranism finds its roots. Uh, we, you know, we would say in ancient church tradition, ancient church theology, ancient church teaching, but more immediately in that story of Martin Luther and his conversation with the Roman Church uh, in the early part of the 16th century. And how do we answer that question? How do I know I am saved? I mean, that that was if you may, kind of the existential question that Luther was asking, how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that God loves me, likes mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. accepts me? Mm -hmm. And he came to a different conclusion than the Roman church at, in his particular day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so do most people who, be, are, who are Lutheran, is it that because this was the faith that they were grown up in? Or is it that when people sort of what I like to go, you know, religious shopping, and they sort of want to find what fits more with them. Um, how is it that people come to, um, you know, being Lutheran? I think probably for us, it's just about like everybody. Uh, you were born into this. You you grew up in it. Mm -hmm. It's familiar to you. Um, probably a large number of us. That's how we got there. Mm -hmm. That's how I got there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my family even has a funny story about it. My 
my father was born on the boat on the way to the United States. From Germany? Uh, from Hungary. Okay. And the best that we could tell, his family was undoubtedly Roman Catholic. And when they landed and got to the community in which they settled, the Lutheran church happened to be German speaking. And they spoke German from where they were from. And so they were able to go and form community. They, and they were also aware of, this was the early part of the 20th century, that there was some persecution, some persecution might be a harsh word for it, of Roman Catholics in the United States. Catholics were looked down upon. So they figured out they didn't want to be Catholic. And so they chose this tradition because it spoke a language that mm -hmm. they were able to still mm -hmm. colloquially speak. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how we ended up being Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the tradition. Uh, I suspect a lot of people do. Then there is that general, as you suggest. Mm -hmm. You know, man, yeah, I like what they do. Uh, right. You know, I like the sermon, or I like the building, or right. I like the choir. You know, right. you know those kinds of choices that we make. And then, but you, um, you had your degree is in um, economics and finance Correct. with a minor in philosophy. So I thought maybe that was what led you to a more of a spiritual path. But how did you know that you like? Did you feel you had a calling, or was this? I mean, how did you get to to be where you are in terms of your own personal journey? Um, you know, I like to say, well, I haven't really quite decided yet. Okay. So ask me tomorrow, and the the answer might be different. But. Uh, when I was in college, I had, I had the opportunity to work in Washington, D.C. I worked for FDIC. Uh, for and FDIC is? Uh, the, Federal Deposit Insurance okay, Company. The, the okay, I just wanted to make sure that wasn't like a, because you know, oh, it's the FDFL? FD, no, FSL, the, for the, for the, Savings Loan right. Association, which is an association. No, no, but there's a religious organization that no. also has some, okay, so you're talking about yeah, the they're, they're talking right. about banking. You're right, right, the Federal so, Bank Savings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Federal Bank Savings, essentially. And... And while I was there, uh, there was this guy who said, you're Lutheran, right? Uh, however, he found that out. And this was probably 1983, summer 1983. And he said, Here, here's this book that I've been reading. You might be interested in it. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship. And Bonhoeffer was, was a famous Lutheran pastor in Germany uh, during the war, pre-war, during the war. and and died during the war in his opposition to the Nazi party. And so he wrote this book, and it was published in 1937, about what did he think it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, was, and, and it was kind of one of those books that, like, nobody ever told me this. Right. right? You know, yeah. I, I've grown up in this. Uh, nobody ever told me this. And, and what was it that you were told? In the book that you said, well, you know, the, the book, the book is, is is this classic Christian spiritual piece of Christian spirituality in which the 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 actual German title of the book is Nachfolge, which means following. And so his question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Okay. And it's an extended study of the sermon on Jesus's sermon on the mount. Okay. And Bonhoeffer is talking, and, he, and he's talking about this in a time when he is sensing this change in Germany. It's the rise of the Nazis, 19, you know, late 1930s. Right. And he's sensing what's happening in Germany. And he's asking him the question as a Christian, so what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Because at the same time, then there's all of this other stuff that's, that's happening uh, within the church, at where will the, at least the national church align with Nazism and mm -hmm. the things that are happening? Mm -hmm. And he's trying to ask the question about what does it mean to be a disciple? And what does it mean to follow Jesus? And so he's taking, trying to take seriously that Jesus has told us what it means. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's compiled in this thing that we know of as the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount. And, and that it's something radically different than probably we've asked um, that, that Jesus's primary concern in this story is not about getting you safely into heaven when you die, but, but being God's people in this world. And so the book is this extended conversation about what does it look like to follow Jesus or mm -hmm. be a disciple and mm -hmm. to live as God's people in this world. And, we didn't talk about that, at least in the church uh -huh. that I grew up in, or frankly, most churches. What does it look like to actually embody 
what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of like this, wow. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got back to college that fall and in a class that we were in, we read this book called um, A Theology of Liberation by Gustavo Gutierrez, which mm -hmm. was written in Latin America, a famous, you know, kind of a famous book, uh, uh, a little controversial, but, but Gutierrez was essentially trying to find a way, at least in the Latin American context of the 70s and 80s, and all of the things that were happening in Latin America right. at that time, right. what does it mean to be a serious Christian in that particular context? And mm -hmm. so in some ways, he was asking the same question in a moment of, uh, turbulence and crisis, mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean? And in many ways, he, what he was talking about was crossing over this. And I was fascinated in that conversation. Mm -hmm. of what does it mean to take Jesus seriously in the world? Mm -hmm. And I ended up being a parish pastor where I guess sometimes you could say we don't take that as seriously because our, what we take seriously is how to get people to join our churches. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, for me, it's that been that ongoing Mm -hmm. conversation. How so, do, how because, do do um, I mean, isn't it, I mean, if you look at the, the precepts of Jesus, isn't that the same across the, the board that, that what it means to, you know, practice, serve Jesus? Isn't that the same, like, you know, to take care of your fellow man, to, sure. you know, um, I mean, isn't that, so, so why is it, would it be, um, like, there are different nuances I guess, to it, like what you're saying that you were never told. So what does it mean, um, in, I guess, in the Lutheran or for you when you say to follow Jesus? Well, I, you know, I, I, I guess the way I would talk about it, uh, at least the way within classic Christianity is to, to have the conversation of we believe, we think, we understand that Jesus comes and one of his one of the things he's doing right. is to display to us what it means to be a full human being. Right. You know, so what in our conversation, what do we think God's intentions for how a human life is supposed to look? Well, we look we look at his life. Uh, you know, right. that's the kind of the right. first step. And then right. what you do with that idea of Trinity and divinity and, you know, there are theological conversations okay. within that and what that means, but at its essential core, we, you know, we see that's part of, at least in our, in classic Christianity statement that here he is as a human, he really was a human, and this is part of God's understanding of what does a human life uh -huh. look like. So does that mean that you, um, because so much of Christianity is what you you're sort of what you do now is to get you into heaven or for the afterlife, right? I mean, that's part of how sometimes some branches right. and some parts of Christianity right. have talked about that. Right. Yeah. So, but is it more now, like for what you're saying, is it more like, like Judaism, which is all about what you do now? It's all about the here and now. It's for the next generation. It's it's you know serving the world. It's you know making a difference. Is that more so that the I don't mean to say. Yeah, say that yeah. the reward isn't heaven, it's the reward is what you, you know, sort of, you reap what you sow kind of thing. Is that more the um, sort of approach to it? Or? You know, I, again, there's a lot of conversation that happens around that, and there's right. a lot of debate as to, dare we say, who's right. Right. And, and that happens within Judaism too, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that the conversation is then, for some of us, and, and this is a little bit of what Bonhoeffer was driving at, okay. and maybe even Gutierrez is driving at, is that Jesus is not immediately about getting me safely into heaven when mm -hmm. I die, mm -hmm. but that God's world, and, and the code word we use for that, at least in the church, is mm -hmm. heaven. Okay. God's world, or heaven, in the life and work of Jesus, is being brought into this world. That 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 divide between heaven and earth, and, and however, right. you know, and that's a, that's a hard conversation in, right. in a scientific age. That that divide between the supernatural and the here and now mm -hmm. is being erased, mm -hmm. and 
And so how we live, how, what we do, is a reflection of how we understand God becoming part of this world. That it's not a part of what Bonhoeffer is talking about. It's not this thing that you jump over. You know, you, right. get, you get safely to your death, and then you jump over it, and right. then you get to go to right. heaven. But that at least in Jesus, this, this, this story is, is becoming more of a continuum as opposed to a, okay, you lead a good life and then you get to go to heaven when you die. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of this is kind of happening in both now and then because part of the conversation that Jesus has in the Gospels is, is that you know, the language Jesus uses, or as we translated it, the kingdom of God is among you. And that's kind of code language for heaven. Right? So it's among you. Right? So. Um, when we experience, and I think this might be close to some, some, some ways that, that the Jewish community would say, mm -hmm. when, we, when we feed people, when we work for healing, when we house people, that's, those are God's purpose. Right. right? That, that because we think in heaven, everybody will have enough to eat. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody will have a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. Everybody will have clothes to wear. Right. Everybody will have a relationship right. Right, that, that's meaningful, that's, that's healthy, that, right. that's life-giving. Right. And, and so what I think at least some of us are thinking is, is that Jesus means that's being pulled out of the hereafter into the now. Uh -huh. And so when we feed hungry people, it's an expression of what we actually believe God's purposes are for all right. humanity. Both, both in some future time right. and in the right now. And, and, and that it's supposed to, and this is, and I think this is the thing that we miss a lot, and it's supposed to bring us joy to do that. Right, right. right? And I think that's close to some, some things, at least part of you know, Jewish uh, spirituality and yeah. more understanding sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. I mean, but you brought up an interesting point that you said that in terms of the the scientific elements of, you know, sort of heaven creation and not whatnot, and the sort of relevancy of uh, Lutheran doctrine today, is it more fluid? Like, is it that you sort of, you know, how they, people, there's constitutionalists who believe that you, it's exactly, the intent is exactly, you interpret it how the forefathers wrote it where other justices believe it's a living document that you have to interpret and sort of evaluate within the context of the times. Do you see that that's more what sort of you're open to doing is sort of looking at the teachings or the precepts and sort of then recognizing how to adapt or how you know things change or the the idea of what a family is or marriage or you know or the fact. Well, clearly, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, and. And um, every faith tradition can have its share of strict constructionists and open to whatever, right. uh, you know, and right. we're all trying to find our place right. somewhere in the midst of that. Uh, I have two shelves in my office of books of uh, English translations of what are called Luther's works, you know, mm -hmm. the Luther's commentaries on Bible, uh -huh. on, you know, on various social stuff or whatever. And I know that at least some of my colleagues probably say, well, we got to look and see what Luther said, and then that gives us a, a, a way to do it. And, and Lutherans seem to like to do that, uh -huh. even more than Presbyterians don't look back to John Calvin, maybe because he was kind of dour. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we can get caught in that. Mm -hmm. But Luther lived 500 years ago. Right. So it's more relevant you know, in and, sense. And, and there's, there's this... Uh, statement that kind of can roll around in some Christian communities. You know, Jesus is the answer. Right. Uh, and as a Christian, I'd say I agree with that. But what perhaps is more interesting is what is the question? And one of the challenges always that we have with any sort of stature of a founding person or a right. founding document is that the question for Martin Luther, mm -hmm. or the question for the founders of the United States, is perhaps a little different than the question that we have right now. Mm -hmm. So how do we 
take some of these things right. without just saying, well, I'm going to pick and choose, because we all do that. Right? But to ask that question, but what is our question now? Uh, it seems like Luther, Martin Luther's abiding question is, how do I know I'll get safely into heaven when I mm -hmm. die? Mm -hmm. And that's an important question for sure. Uh, why is it? Why uh, is it such an important question? Well, I mean, because we, we think we're, you know, we think we're we're not only just physical beings, mm -hmm. but at least within traditional Christian theology, we think we're also spiritual, and that there and to some degree or another. And so, okay, that but, sense of a hereafter. But should you? Okay, there's two parts I have to this. One yeah, is, yeah. should you be? Shouldn't you just be doing the, the right thing and treating your fellow man and taking care of them and ensuring because it's the right thing to do, not because you're going to be rewarded for that behavior by getting sure, into heaven? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so isn't that sort of like you're like sort of you're only doing this because you're concerned about your soul? I mean, is that a good way to look at things or is I mean, is that? Is that a better way than saying, well, at least they're do then doing the right thing? Like Right. I, I would offer that question is a more contemporary question than it was 500 years ago. Yes. Okay. And so we might, we might have come to the point where we understand it that way. We, and, and I think we probably share that. Right. You know? But 500 years ago, that wasn't the question. Okay. And then my because other... Exist yeah. you know, Luther or Calvin wouldn't have used the word, ex, you know, existential anxiety was, right. well, how, how, right. how, how do I know I'm, uh, you know, because right. there, there was just a different sense right. of concern about that. We don't live in that era right. as deeply, so our question has shifted. Right. So is your role as the senior pastor of a congregation to get them to ask these, you ask the questions? Or are you the one who helps to provide the answers? Yes. Or is it both? Yes, right, okay. isn't it? I, I mean, like any. I mean, I just wonder because later. I also, um, you know, I just wonder also, I have questions about the idea of why so much about Jesus and following Jesus is so much about love. You know, like you do things for the love of Jesus and you want to be loved. And, and again, I'm going back to why don't you just do it because it's the right thing to do and, it, and it's not about necessarily receiving or getting love and i never understood why that was such a um important element i, I guess that's probably about how do we understand god how do we understand ourselves and how do we understand right. the world um part of what we're saying is is that the creation is an expression of God's love. Okay. Uh, that that. God, or you could say it, it's an expression of everything is created in God's image. So that right. you're living up which, to as a higher being, which isn't love, it's that you respect, it's more respect. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean the classic, the classic Christian, again, the classic Christian way of saying that is, is that all of this exists out of God's love. Now that means that we gotta really work hard at trying to understand what that word means. means. And to love yeah. is a verb. So Correct. it causes, it's not, you can't be passive about it, but you do have to take action. I mean, it's, you know. Correct. You know, and, and in the classic, um, you go off to seminary, one of the things you're, you're tasked to learn is Greek. And, and every seminarian learns, and every, every first new pastor is given this this sermon at one point in their vocational career, you know, the Greeks had three words for love. Right, right. Right, you know, I, I used to tell students who work for me, if I ever hear that sermon come from you, I'm gonna take a hook and pull you off of it, <laughs> pull you out of the pulpit, right? We all, every congregation's heard that. But what I think that's saying is, is that there's more nuance than what the English word love contains. Mm -hmm. Because all words and all language is contextually relevant right, and so right. we probably need to find a way of speaking you know that that love is not just god's not simply god's emotion mm -hmm. but but god's deepest sense of of presence in the world mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. that and that all of this is an expression of god's 
you know, the whole cosmos is an expression of God's deepest presence, deepest sense of self mm -hmm. in the world. And so, yeah, as part of it, we live in it, we, mm -hmm. we are the beneficiaries of it. Right. And, but as part of it that, you know, we come to sense it's bigger than us, we have a minor role in it, it's obviously larger than us. It's, it spans a sense of time that will transcend us, comes before us, comes after us. So how do we, you know, how do we exist within mm -hmm. it? And with all of the other things that are expressions right. of God's presence right. in this world. Right. You know, so I, you're probably right that that word becomes a stumbling block because how we understand that word is right. is, is right. You know. And and clearly partly what we're having now is a very philosophical kind very. of conversation. Yeah. Which goes into though the issue of in today's world and with we were talking about this before we started, with mm -hmm. millennials and lack across the board of religions not joining religious organizations. They don't want organized religion. I mean they don't even join clubs or social clubs or country clubs. I'm wondering is and they're not, you know, they're much more immediate gratification. They're in the tech world. It's all sound bites. It, and there is the issue that they're not coming to religion. Do you think it's because they don't have the attention span to have these philosophical conversations? Or do you no. think it's more that they want more relevant? I mean, what is it that you think is the difficulty of why? And like we, I was saying that in 1991, 6% um, of the American population identified themselves as none, so no religious affiliation or organization. In 2019, that was um, uh, 21%. And we still are doing OK in America that 47.8% of Americans do still identify with a religion. But we're slowly creeping that that's going down and down. So. What is it? Why is it that um, the, the people, the difficulty with organized religion or making it relevant or what, what's the, I don't know, what do you face and how do you approach this? Uh, I'd give you a short answer and a long answer okay. to that. And, and the short answer for me, I think, is that, that, that's, that thing I said earlier, we, we would say, Jesus is the answer, or whatever your religious tradition right. is, there right. is some figure that you would say, this is the answer. Right. But maybe the thing that we've missed is, is then, but what's the question? Right. So what, and, it, and what are the questions we should be asking well, today? Well, there's, there's a, a book that just came out by a guy named Ryan Berge, and the title of the book is Nun, The Nuns. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mean about cloistered ladies. No, no, he means the nuns the, the, that the have nuns. no affiliation the to nuns. religion, right. And, and he I, I articulates three things, but I'll give you a longer, a little example of what we mean. I was ordained in 1989, right? Began vocational ministry, graduated from seminary, began vocational ministry in 1989. And already we were seeing these shifts right. happening, right. right? And everybody's asking, 1989, everybody's asking questions. But the thing that I remember most clearly is that that was the beginning or just at the front end of Sunday soccer. I, I don't know. You might not be old enough to remember 1989. Oh, no. no, no, I graduated college in 1989. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, we, and, and. Right, or soccer and, traveling teams or sports teams. That right. was just kind of like the beginning yeah. of, of yeah. or Sunday baseball or something, right. you know. Yeah. Not, and I'm not talking about going right. to a major league, but right. youth Sunday soccer, that there would be practice on And soccer. that was also really the culmination of the, except for in Fort Wayne, the, the, the no longer blue laws yeah. on Sunday. Yeah, you could yeah those kinds of things. Right. Those kinds right. of things, you know, right. were kind of all coalescing right. in most places across the country at the same time. And all of us, and myself included, all of us just said how terrible, how horrible, how awful that is, right? They shouldn't allow this kind of stuff. And, and we'd say to people, you shouldn't take your, ch you know, and right. we, we usually did it, at least metaphorically, shaking right. a finger right. at everybody. Right. You know, you're ruining your child, or you're, you're not, you know, you're not honoring the Sabbath. You know, all of those right. kinds of, that's what, that was our approach to it. Right. But when we never noticed that no matter what we said about it, everybody, kept, do it. everybody kept taking their kid to Sunday soccer. And, and I, to my embarrassment, I never asked the question until much later, why is Sunday soccer more compelling than Sunday church? Okay. 
Right? That's because we would say Jesus is the answer, but we didn't know what the question was. Okay. Right? You know, why, why would, and we've all faced into that. Right? Well, you're also sort of, you're not, I mean, we, I just feel, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I've always felt with Christianity, you're not supposed to question. Like, you're supposed to accept that this is, you know, well, what Jesus told us, this is the, this is what we're supposed to do. I mean, Judaism is all about questioning. I mean, you, you know, that's right. the whole thing. You right. know, we're not supposed to agree about anything. Right, right, so right, right. I think that, um, and you do sort of feel like you're going to be shamed or guilted or something. Because we did that. Right, and someone's right. going to say, shake their finger at you. Well, so, so when we you were, ask this right. question, right, what did you find out? Well, the, basically, Sunday soccer is more interesting than what I do on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, or maybe you need to have More services compelling. before Sunday soccer. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that never dawned on us, right? That, but I think the deeper sense was that we believed, and, and maybe in many ways still believe, that we were the purveyors of eternal life. Who was? The, the church. The church, the, the church. physical. The, the church, the community, okay. the, the religious organization. Okay. And I think this cuts across not just yeah. Lutheranism. Right. It could be Roman Catholicism, okay. it could be Presbyterians, right. it could, you know, it could be Methodist. We all still were working out of that assumption that the reformers were working out of that, you know, my, my deepest question is what happens to me after I die? And Is Berge, that really the deepest question? Well, but that's the thing that Berge says in his book. And then so, and, so and couple, our, we don't live in that time any longer. There, there's this huge book it's got by a guy named Charles Taylor called A Secular Age. And Charles Taylor, who is a, a Canadian Roman Catholic philosopher, builds up this huge book on saying, we don't live in a mystical age any longer. We don't live in a time where people's first concern is about what happens to me after I die. Right. So you're correct. Right. And in that sense, so what you're asking then, you know, and it's taken me a long time to get around to this, right? So you're asking the same question out loud that a lot of my people, a lot of our community is subtly or not even knowingly asking. Or uh, afraid my, to ask. Yeah, because they because think that's that what everything is built upon well, in the faith. Everything in, in, in my organization, at least the way is constructed is about getting you safely into heaven when you die. Right. And, and that's crass and that's harsh and that doesn't. Right. And and, and I again, sort of feel like, why am I worrying about what's going to happen after I die when I should be worrying about how am I living? You, you know? and at least twenty one percent of right, the pe exactly. people in this country, right? Right. And, and because we're not paying attention to okay. that, because we're not paying attention to that question. Okay. And, and we still think, well. Because we we believe it, and even if you're asking that, you can ask that question. You know, I still believe in this unity, body, soul. That there is something beyond this. Mm -hmm. that, you know, there is something beyond how we experience time. This is still an important question. But when nobody else is asking the question, I'm dare I say I'm providing an answer that nobody cares about, I, or at least a lot of people don't care. I about. don't know, because I mean. I would argue that that's the same thing about being a journalist, okay? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when people say to me, well, how do you decide like what you're going to write about or who you're going to have on a, a program or something? And I always say to myself, if I have the question, then I believe others are having the question. They just may not be asking it. Yeah. So I think that sometimes you can't wait till someone asks the question. Right. Sure. I think sometimes you just have to think that... Well, if I have the question or you see it, then maybe you have to address it. Or or be smart enough to, or, or observant enough, or care enough right. to look around the world and find out, huh, nobody's <laughs> listening to what I'm saying. Right. Although, but then if we go back to the whole idea of like Sunday soccer, right? Now, granted, during COVID, people couldn't go to Sunday soccer, but all religious organizations saw an incredible bump in through Zoom and being able maybe also to watch a, a sermon or a service anytime they wanted, everybody saw this lift of the participation in more organized religion. So mm -hmm. that also maybe tells you maybe it's not always at a certain time. And, and, and I know that 
that, and really that um, Trinity, that you have done some really innovative things in thinking about the answers to these questions. So tell me some of the things like you've talked about, like the idea of having the um, church open or the sanctuary open at certain times for pe anybody to come in or, you know, reaching out to the community. Talk about some of the things, the answers to these questions and what that has led you to do. Yeah, well, you know, we, I, uh, I had a chance to, to be in London with some fellow clergy friends and be with some friends who are uh, clergy in, in the city of London. And one of the things we found out is, is that the Bishop of London, you know, church life in England is different just because of the fact that there is this established church that's right. part of but it. But then there's also like the church of the, like the right. king and queen. I mean, it's... That is, that, the, that's the established the, church, right, right, right? The established church, you know. But the Bishop of London, at one point mandated that all of the churches in his diocese in London had to be open every day at some time that was not a worship time. Mm -hmm. And for people to come in, not, not to go to a formal worship time, right. but just to come in, right. either to, to get out of the heat, to get out of the cold, right. to to look around, I mean, there's some interesting buildings there, but that everybody has to be open at least a little bit every day on their terms for their time. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by that, that, you know, when thinking about my building and thinking about all of these numerous buildings in the city of churches, mm -hmm. when it's not worship time, all of us are locked up as tight as drawing. Right. They're closed, yeah. We're closed, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we build these huge edifices and we lock the door. Right. They're not, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are... Uh, and they're some... very, I mean, based on the architect and the time that they were built, I mean, they are a little austere and a little cold and a little, you know, yeah. like just these, yeah. well, these you buildings. Know, if nothing else, so, and there are some, some churches even, in, and occasionally even mine, you couldn't even figure out which door to go in. Oh yeah, no, that happened to me. Yeah, I couldn't be. <laughs> well, you, you know, you're looking at this thing, and well, even if I wanted to talk to, even if I thought I wanted to talk to a pastor because right. I'm in, I'm in an emotional crisis. Right. I, I want to talk to somebody. Right. How do I find the door? <laughs> I mean, think about that, right? So, so we're here for you, and and I lock, we lock up as tight as a drum. Well, I know Sunday for you, it, you could go where like the parking lot is. Yeah, yeah, right. You have you know, an entrance there. <laughs> And even at that, we treat you like you're, you know, you're, you're a suspect and you're, you know, you're a shady person. Maybe you are. Uh, but that, that, but that sense, doesn't preclude even if you're a shady person that you may want to talk well, to maybe, somebody. Maybe, having, you right. know, I think part of my business is dealing with shady people. Some of them, you know, well, I might think, even be related to me. Right, uh, right, exactly. You know, and so, but that really struck me when I heard that, that, oh my gosh, he's talking about me. And so uh, we came back and a couple of parishioners were with us and, and we said, well, what, what if we just had times where we just opened the church? Not, not again, that sense, right. not for worship. We're not there to, right. to manage your time. Come in, mm -hmm. you know, let mm -hmm. us share this thing that we have mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. right? you know? mm -hmm. um, and we got volunteers who would then be mm -hmm. there to, mm -hmm. to welcome people as they came mm -hmm. in, you know, answer the questions if they mm -hmm. have any. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we're like everybody, we're afraid that somebody will steal the candlesticks. I, you know, and I said, you know, the building's built out of limestone and slate and the pews are bolted to the floor. Right, I mean, right. Uh, you know, if you want to steal a Bible, go for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You right. know, but again, we had, had sometimes we have this fear um, and there is this statement from St. Paul, you know, perfect, or from, from St. John, perfect love drives out fear. So, so we should stop being as fearful and just open the place. Mm -hmm. and, and while we don't have as many people wander through the building as we might like, mm -hmm. you know, wandering and wandering, right. and, you know, and, and we want, to, want it to be a safe place for the people who work there for all that kind of stuff. But, but just that notion of Putting a sign out, opening the door and putting a sign out, you know, this way in, uh, you're welcome, at least in these times, which aren't on our, on our schedule, our right. worship schedule, right. but on your worship schedule. Right. Uh, 
And then do you have like a spiritual leader or a pastor or somebody who's available at those times? Like at, Not directly. No. I, I mean, usually one of us is, is in the building, and mm -hmm. if somebody came by and wanted mm -hmm. to talk to a pastor, mm -hmm. most of the time mm -hmm. somebody is mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. would come and, mm -hmm. and speak. But What about using um, music? I mean, you, you have, I mean, like I told you, I live next door to your yeah, assistant yeah, musical yeah. director, and music is very, very important and very much um, within the, what Trinity is known for. What about using music as a, like, under, like even like sometimes I would think, well, what if I wanted to come and, you know, come to a, sort of to listen to the music? Like, yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't necessarily know if I would feel like if that's okay. Like, I don't know if I have to be a member. You know, there's those kinds of nuances, mm -hmm. but I just think music is always, food and music are always good gathering. And I know that before COVID, you had the farmer's market as Correct. well. Correct. So, Correct. but what about that, I, you know, or reach out to the community that way in terms of... Um, yeah, and we do, you know, musical programs that then are open to mm -hmm. anybody who... Mm -hmm you know, who comes along, mm -hmm. uh, who anybody who is, is right. interested in that right. as well. But I think the, the, the larger question then is, is how do we open ourselves in a larger way to the community on its terms as opposed mm -hmm. to mine? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I saw from some of my friends in London, that asking the question, we, we ask the question and we already have answered it in our heads. But how do you actually ask the question to let somebody else tell you the answer uh -huh. and, and, and take them seriously enough, care enough about them right. to think that your answer is not silly or mm -hmm. misguided or, it, mm -hmm. or your question is not silly or misguided. It's, it's, it's your question. Right. Right. Uh, uh, without me superimposing what I think your question should be or what I think the answer is already given. Mm -hmm. And and so we've tried to do... Well, so you started a, um, a position, you had a community outreach Correct. person. Um, are you still, is that, I know Sarah left, are you still continuing that? Was that successful? We, continue, we continued that. I mean, obviously we can't say everything with COVID, but... Yeah, we continued that. Uh, Sarah, Sarah left and, and then we continued with another staff person and then in the midst of COVID when right. some of that kind of stuff just right. wasn't possible. Right. Uh, but are you hoping to like you yeah, had a really good to. program, God on Tap? Yeah. Where you would, are, I mean, those to me seem, and that might be a good way to meet. Like again, you said, it's sort of you open the building so that when people are ready, but maybe also you have to go out in the community and meet people where they are. Correct. Not you know, because because isn't I mean we see these beautiful buildings, and if we're if we have, and it was um, Javier Mondragon said mm -hmm. this. If we have all these churches and everything, why do we still have so many problems in the community? You know, like, so maybe is it also that you need to come outside the building? Because isn't God everywhere? I mean, isn't sure. that the idea? Sure. That you sure. don't only have to, so maybe you could worship at the, I'm not, I'm not yeah. being, I'm being a little facetious about at the sidelines of the <laughs> Sunday soccer game. But I mean, what is it that you feel that you, you get, that you can only get sitting in a service that you couldn't get like on the side, you know, or at your home or reading or, you know, what is it that you feel? Well, I think we, we uh, are the answer that we give to that is community. Okay. Uh, real community. Now, I think what happened with some of the stuff through COVID and I mean, we had this massive uptick in participation. Right. I, I mean, numbers that transcend a generation and a half. Okay. Right. So. Now, is that maybe, translating now to people coming to services, or are you still keeping the, the Zoom? Yeah, or? we're 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 keeping. We do it as a live stream, and then it also streams onto Facebook Live. And still now, the in-person worshiping attendance is smaller than it had been, but the online worshiping attendance if you may, is still standing up. And, and the question we're asking is, you know, kind of trying to internally ask ourselves is, is how do we help form community with people who are online, and mo many of whom we don't know who they are? And, you know, that could be part of the appeal of that is, is that I don't have to reveal myself. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you, know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have to mm -hmm. figure out how do we work with that and accept it and, mm -hmm. and live in mm -hmm. to it. Uh, so we're kind of asking that question, how does it, now that 
we're kind of in a more hybrid world if you're in and out and right. you know, part of right. part and parcel with this. But you you know you touched on an interesting thing that we can tell from the statistics of the the equipment that we use. Close to a third of the people don't watch us in real time. Mm -hmm. So you're coming to you know you're coming at a different you're coming at a different time. Right. 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 You know, ten thirty isn't your time right? for a variety right. of reasons. And, right. And so this opens up the questions that we haven't answered before, but now are trying but to. They, but you did in some ways, because you recognize that you sh the building should be open, not only when you worship, so then you have to question, well, you should offer worship not only at 1030 on Sundays, right. so that people can, you know, and then, um, and you also have, but you have a really invested a lot in your graphic design and your technology, right. and you have really right. incredible camera operation, and um, I mean, how many cameras do you say that you There's have? There's 10 in there. Right. There's 10 in and there. So, so you really also recognize, not that you're putting on a show or you're entertaining, that's not it, but right. you recognize that you have to incorporate some of those elements into what you want to do if you want to remain relevant and attract people, because right. Right. that's what's important. Right. You know, I, you know that, uh, and there's always a delicate balance that we're, we're trying to, to walk there, where it's not just an entertaining Right. You know, and entertainment. Uh, uh, Although, if you had an entertaining sermon, and you know, you know, obviously people would, you know, they would enjoy than, that more. Yeah, we've all heard that sermon. I've given that sermon. I suspect of just like, oh my gosh, Lord, in your mercy, end this sermon. You know, right. and, <laughs> please right. just sit down. But um, I always think it would be good, like if people laugh or yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. So you know, I, I mean, to do that. So we're we're fortunate at Trinity that we have the resources to be able to install 10 cameras into this somewhat iconic right. kind of building. Right. And it gives the, our guy who runs those cameras the ability to then intersperse. Right. Uh, yeah. Make it more visual. Make but it more visual. you also have like a graphic design artist who yeah. also works on your graph. I mean, right. you really have, in that sense, really recognize the importance of how yeah, to present experience. it. Yeah, yeah that experience. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't always make it any better than my neighbor who has a cell phone on a tripod because that's what, you know, those are the resources that their congregation has. And her, his message could be as, you know. Right. A, but presentation bad, matters. Yeah, I mean, and people kind of notice that. Right. And, and, that, and that's all, especially with the younger generation. Yeah. Um, but but still, you, it finally comes down to, you know, finally, though, if anybody comes back, it still has to finally come down to somehow we have to be on purpose or or not on purpose answering your sometimes unasked question. Right, right, right. right. Because that's the only reason you're going to come back. Right. You know, I remember when I first came to Trinity, I, uh, well, why would anybody come to this church? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a beautiful building. Okay. So I've come in, I've looked at it, and I go home. It's like a museum. Then it's then it's a museum. Right. Why why okay. would you come back to the museum right. again right. next week? So okay. you haven't, an, you know. Right. I can have these things, but if people don't perceive that I'm answering, or our time together is answering anything right. for you, right? Uh, you'll come a couple of times. You might come out on nostalgia on Christmas, and, right? Uh, or maybe on Easter, but how do we? get at that. And, and then for, obviously for me, trying to understand what it is that you're trying to ask so that I could speak uh -huh. in a clearer way uh -huh. to that particular thing. And so how do you do that? Like when you're up against, you know, I mean, I believe that what they say is that millennials and people are very spiritual and they have faith, but they just don't want the organized religion. But then you also have nowadays, the issue also is how do you have diversity and reflect that? Because if it's something you've grown up with or, you know, how do you reflect the bigger world or people who are in um, interfaith or interracial relationships or marriages, how do they feel? And then also now you have another whole issue, which I think has been difficult in religious organizations, is mental health issues. So how do you look at all these and address them in in today's world. I mean, I just feel so much of what you do now is so much beyond just the worrying about, I don't mean this, in, but the saving of souls to go, you know, it's so much more 
than that. So how do you look at all of these issues and then sort of say, these are the questions we need to answer or what are you doing to help um, like with these issues? Well, I, I think we go back to, I mean, for me, I go back to 1983 and reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. Um, how do we embody the story of Jesus, at least in the way that he told it to us, uh, in the world? It, that, that book that I referenced, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Berge's uh, The Nuns, he talks about three particular things. Okay. One is the rise of secularism, and Charles Taylor, as I also said, talked about that, which means that people are asking a completely different question right. and experiencing the world in a completely different way. So, right. so to take that seriously. And, right. and people, I, I think in some ways when, when you say, I'm spiritual but not religious, what right. you're, maybe that's a code word for saying, I don't, I don't need you to get me into heaven. I can get myself there. Or, or I can get myself there, or that's not my... Uh, motivation. Uh, and, um, right. my, my deeper, you know, I'm spiritual, so I'm trying to be in communion with this world. Right. I'm trying to be present or mindful this, or, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you may or may not be worried about your eternal soul or whatever that, that kind of means. But uh, so you're trying to, so we got to hear that. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, again, in my in my reading of the scriptures, there was no human being more present in his moment than Jesus. Right. I mean, when, when you, if we read any of those, even if we don't believe them, the stories that are, that are presented, there is no human being more present right. in this world with right. other people than, than, than right. Jesus. Did he, ever, did he ever talk about what he was doing so that he could get into heaven. I don't... No, we never... That's, right, never, that's, what that's I thought. never the conversation. Right. That's it's never, never the conversation. It's never a conversation, right? Yeah, it's never the, okay. That's never where the conversation you know, I, I mean, I studied yeah, it yeah. more as an yeah. academic right. than, you know, from that but standpoint. Still, but still, he is extremely present. And, okay. You know, and, and the thing that we hear from people is, is that, you know, I'm not Christian. What, what you're saying is you don't want to be part of the church, but you see this story about this, this person who is as present as anybody ever is... That's, you know, how do we be more present with right. people? And putting others on, before himself. Right. And me more present with people okay. in the same way that we see Jesus doing. That, you know, if we okay. want to be his, if you're a Christian, if you take that, that title, you know, if I want to be a disciple follower of Jesus, he's showing what that means. And, that, and the bulk of that is about being present with people and this world in this creation in this moment now and and i think the secret is, and, and we've been missing it all along that's the same thing even if you you're you're not worried about whatever the hereafter you're worried about this world secularism this moment this mm -hmm. time this space this community not religious well you're probably still wanting to be present right and you'd probably like me to be present with you right Right. You know, so so there's there's that, and and Berge kind of touches on it, and he, and I think he kind of disparages whether or not the church could actually do that. I'm a little more optimistic that okay. if we really worked at it and uh -huh. took it seriously, I think we probably could. Okay. He he does then point out two other things. Okay, One wonder. is uh, the rise of politics in everything. Right. And we all know that's that's a long conversation, but you know, everybody has kind of gotten sucked into this conversation, and and it's tainted. Not that not that our political life isn't important, but but in a deep negative kind of way, as we know, and it's created such divisiveness and fractions right. beyond. And, yeah. and um, there was a a long time ago. There was a, a book that came out that talked about God. You know, Jesus is neither a Democrat nor a Republican, but we forget that, right? We try to, we always are trying to affiliate God with our, right, right. With our purposes. So, but that has taken such a an ugly turn, especially okay. in the last ten years. Okay. Uh, and and people rightly kind of look at that and like, well. Mm -hmm. And the third. Uh, and and the third is is that we're just not that interesting. I. 
Meaning, uh, meaning each other, or you mean the the church and church, the, the uh, church, the church. I, I have uh, well, that goes some, back to the idea of being a little entertaining and a little, you well, know. You know, I, some of my staff hate it when I say this, but I have this friend in London, Lucy Winkett, and she's a, 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 the rector of a, a famous church in London, and she said one time, "Most church fun isn't very fun." <laughs> you know, and and. and you know, and there's kind of like the, the soccer thing, right? There's nothing right. that compelling right. about, about church as it is. Uh, you know, it might, you know, Starbucks and the New York Times can be more compelling on a Sunday morning for a lot of people. To, and, 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 and you know what? I understand that. Uh-huh. Uh, so in an age of constant entertainment, you know, how to how to navigate that. And maybe that's some of what we were seeing with the stuff in the COVID world of, you know, I can, I can come later. I can come on my time mm -hmm. and my convenience. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, if it's recorded, I can fast forward to the part that I want. And when I'm done, I can end. Right, and I can get up and yeah. Right, the, you right. know, the average viewing time on the recorded stuff is somewhere around 13 minutes, which they say is kind of long. That's very long because normally it's about an eight to nine. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, about, so you know, uh, you so know, you're getting I, them, you're keeping them. Right. So, so we're kind of, you know, I, I'm able to do the thing, but you know, if you come to Sunday morning worship, I mean, you're stuck there till we're done. Well, you're not, but right. you kind, I'm, you kind of are. You kind of are, right? You, and you, you know, accept that. Those, the pew makes noise in the floor. Uh, yeah, everybody's gonna see you stand up. They're gonna see you walk out. Right. Right? You know, and, uh, unless you're uh, some of our Roman Catholic uh, siblings, where they come late and leave early. You know, right. you know, we joke about that all the time. But, but you know, I can come on my terms. I can stay for the amount that I need, and then I, and then I can be done. And, and I think that ties into the things sometimes in our business, because we're invested in doing it, we, we think because we're invested in it, you should be invested right. in it. And we don't always like it when people basically say, eh, not so much. Right. We do this, it, it, what I find fascinating is we also do this um, thing, it's called Trinity in 20. So we record the sermon and prayers and we put it up on, on YouTube on Sunday morning, and how many people actually just watch that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like boom. Right. Well, because they could uh -huh. be because they could be working out. They could be yeah. doing twenty minutes. Right. You know, right. I, I mean, you know, and we disparage that, or at least I, you know, I've disparaged other people. Disparage. Well, you know, that's not really church. Well, but it's speaking to something that. Right. I, you know, we've come with presuppositions of what's important, and and if I've invested my life in, oh, obviously, I think I want it. I want you to invest your life in it, right. but it becomes asking those questions and we've done a, all of us have done a poor job in taking seriously what people have been saying to us, either with their words, with their actions, or, their act, right. or, or you know, right. their lives. Right. Um, that, you know, one of the, the things is, is that people leave my church, they leave any church, and, and sometimes they're angry. You know, they're angry at what we say, they're angry at the pastor, they're angry at the worship, they don't like the, the music style, mm -hmm. they don't like the, this. Um, but there's a lot of good data that's pointing to most of the people who have left us, they're not mad, they're not angry. It's just, we're not doing anything that they value. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, the things that, that, you know, to go back to my, my friend's phrase, most church fun isn't very fun. Most church just, it, it's not engaging. You know, it's easy to, mm -hmm. it's easier to go to soccer. And so, instead of, you know, and instead of disparaging that, uh, you have we, to should figure out, we should listen. We should listen. And, and also yeah. ask, and maybe ask different and deeper questions. Yeah, we should listen. So. Yeah. You know, I sit down at the park on Thursdays. This is one of the things we've done, you know. Um, and I don't have an advertisement for my for the church. I, just, I, I wear a cleric, so right. I don't want people figuring out. Right. Oh my gosh, this guy's clergy, and right. you know it's a bait and switch. So if you sit down in my chair, you know the chair, it's you talk, I listen, and if you, it's been this great thing. I I enjoy it not only because I get to sit outside on a Thursday afternoon. Right. And I right. kind of like doing that, but the people who walk by, who who you don't know, who will take an effort. They'll, they'll tell you all sorts of things. Uh -huh. it, you know, it's it, an opportunity. It's, it's the truth is, if you just 
ask the questions and listen. Yeah. But people, you know, that's what people want. I mean, and, and it is just being able to ask questions and so and not thinking that you have the answers. Yeah. And so speaking of questions, yeah. at the end of each Ian Good Company show, I ask each guest the same 12 questions that were popularized by the French novelist Marcel Proust from a Victorian parlor game. What is your favorite word? Yes. What is your least favorite word? Maybe. Which one do I use more, though? <laughs> <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Being, being with the people that I work with. What turns you off creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, listening to conversations about church. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise do I love? Uh, my wife's voice, my grandson's voice, my hearing my children on Zoom. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, really bad violin playing. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I, I wanted to go into banking. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to work for the Federal Reserve. There, how's that? Okay. What profession would you not like to do? Uh, some days mine. Uh, just sitting at home, doing nothing. What do you consider your greatest achievement? Uh, the ability to, to, with my wife, raise two young men who seem to be relatively happy. Who, living or dead, would you most like to have a conversation with? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. How would you like to die? Uh, peacefully in my bed. Okay. And usually it's paraphrased, if heaven exists. But mm -hmm. for you, I'm going to say, heaven exists. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You got a lot of it right. Well, I think you've got a lot of it right well, here. Thanks. And I would love to have you come back because I think having these conversations and asking thanks. questions is exactly why I'm doing this. Because yeah, I think yeah. that we need to get more. And I think getting you to really look at it differently and for people to see that you are thinking about it and asking questions is really makes it more relevant and relatable. Yeah, so I thanks. appreciate it. Thanks. Well, it's good to be with you. Well, thank you. Thanks. And you can learn more about Anne Good Company and all the other great conversations we have had at annegoodcompany.info. And we look forward to next week when you can again enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company.